Hello and welcome to New Frontiers on CCTV International. I'm Ji Xiaojun in Beijing. In today's program, we are continuing with our major series in which we are investigating archaeological discoveries, historical sites and cultural relics in order to trace the evolution of Chinese civilization down through the ages. In August 1368, the Yuan Dynasty fell when an uprising led by Zhu Yuanzhang captured the capital, Beijing. Later that year, Zhu Yuanzhang had himself proclaimed emperor and established the Ming Dynasty. The first half of the new dynasty saw agriculture develop to a level never seen before. The improved agricultural technology freed up labor, which in turn encouraged the development of handicrafts industry and commerce. A number of significant cultural advances were made under the Ming Dynasty, symbolized by the Yongle Bell, the Forbidden City, and blue and white porcelain. China also raised its profile on the international stage, thanks in no small part to the great navigator Cheng He. Through his voyages to the Western Seas, he helped strengthen ties between the Ming Dynasty and the governments in other parts of the world. Today, nearly 500 years after the end of the Ming Dynasty, its wonders continue to fascinate. There is the colossal Yongle Bell, which tolled in the year 2000 to celebrate the beginning of the new millennium. There are the golden glazed tiles in the Forbidden City that shine against Beijing's azure sky. And then there are the legendary voyages made by Zheng He to the Western Seas. During the Ming Dynasty, there were new achievements in architecture, shipbuilding, porcelain making, and textiles. Products made in China were already well known throughout the world for their high quality and supreme craftsmanship. But during the Ming Dynasty, Chinese technology was to reach an unprecedented level. In the process, adding yet more vibrant colors to the civilization of China and the world. The Ming Dynasty was founded in the year 1368, and after a few years of recovering following the overthrow of the previous dynasty, the nation began to thrive once again. In the year 1405, the Ming Emperor proclaimed that a magnificent royal palace would be built in Beijing. Today, that palace is commonly referred to as the Forbidden City. While construction of the new royal palace was underway, more than 300 ships from China, the largest fleet of vessels sent out on a mission of exploration in the history of the planet, was in full sail on the Indian Ocean. This was the first voyage of Zheng He, an envoy of the Ming Emperor, who had been sent out into the Western Seas. As Zheng He's vessels plied the waves, back in Beijing, 230,000 craftsmen from every conceivable trade were joined by a million laborers to start work at the construction sites of the Forbidden City. Officials and their legmen had ventured into remote forests in Sichuan, Hunan and Hubei provinces in search of the very best timber and construction stone. The Emperor of Ming had a dream that his nation would become a formidable power accorded due respect from lands across the ocean. To help him bring this about, the emperor selected Zheng He to be the commander of a massive fleet, and he was perfect for the job. 35 years old, tall, handsome, courageous and very intelligent, Zheng He had many military feats and accomplishments behind him, and what was more, he was familiar with diplomatic protocol. To accomplish the mission entrusted to him, and before facing a voyage in uncharted waters that was certain to be perilous, Zheng He had first to obtain ships capable of withstanding the demands of such a long journey into the unknown.
Between 1403 and 1405, almost every site in the middle and lower reaches of the Yangtze River and China's southeast was converted into shipyards, and orders were placed for more than 2,000 ships. The Longjiang Shipyard in Nanjing became the largest ship construction facility in the world. Timber of all sizes literally flooded into the shipyard via the Yangtze River, and there thousands of workers were ready and waiting to begin work. Shipbuilding and navigation are like twins, as both require the most advanced technologies in hydromechanics, material mechanics, astronomy, meteorology, and manufacturing. The ability of a nation to build great ships has always mirrored the general level of science and technology in that nation's society. The level of shipbuilding technology achieved during the Ming Dynasty was seen first in the size of the ships produced. The largest type of ship in Zheng He's fleet, known as a treasure boat, was truly massive. At 126.72 meters long and 51.84 meters wide, it was larger than an Olympic-sized soccer field. It had a displacement of 10,000 tons and was able to carry a thousand people. Christopher Columbus's Santa Maria, built 87 years later, was just 35 meters long, one fifth the size of one of Zhang He's treasure boats. In the shipyards, the shipbuilders worked day and night. The Longjiang shipyard had many workshops under it, each specializing in a different task, such as carpentry, mechanics, and sail making. Other items needed, such as ropes and nails, were supplied from elsewhere. From objects unearthed at the shipyard, Archaeologists have determined that every piece of timber that arrived in the shipyard was numbered, and this means the shipyard implemented a standardized workflow system, rather like a modern-day assembly line. A treasure boat was truly massive, it had no less than seven floors, three above the main deck and four below. Of the lowest two decks, one contained rocks to stabilize the ship, while the other was for storing food and fresh water. The other two floors below deck accommodated sailors and soldiers. The second floor above deck, the most comfortable, had the best view, the freshest air and suffered from the least movement. This deck was, of course, reserved for officials. The top floor was a working area for lookouts, although part of it was set aside for a luxurious guest room. Following the experience of centuries of seafarers before him, Zhang He's treasure boat was made in the shape of a V. Its sternum consisted of long timbers fastened tightly by iron bars. This was done to ensure the maximum stability. But as well as this, the ship had a ballast design. The ratio between the length and width of the ship was 2 to 45, a ratio that prevented the hull from snapping in violent seas. Modern experimentation has proved that the maximum strength for the hull of a ship is achieved when it is between 340 to 380 millimetres thick. The hulls of Zheng He's treasure boats fell precisely within these limits. Building such massive treasure boats during the Ming Dynasty when screws and welding were unknown was truly an extraordinary achievement. There's a simple explanation as to why China could build such massive treasure ships as Zheng He's. The fact was, throughout its long history and since the Qing and Han dynasties in particular, China had been developing the shipbuilding technology and navigational skills to make it a major seafaring power. China had been the world leader in shipbuilding and navigation since the Qin and Han dynasties around 2,000 years ago. During the Song dynasty around 1,000 years ago, China was building very large ships according to highly rational designs. They even had watertight compartments to lessen the chances of sinking. 
but the huge ships built for Zheng He during the Ming Dynasty pushed Chinese shipbuilding technology and navigation to new and unprecedented levels. But after completion, how was such a massive ship moved out of the yard and into the sea? Inside Zhongbao village, to the west of present-day Nanjing city, three long and narrow pools can be seen. Each pool is 40 meters wide, and they lie parallel to one another very close to the Yangtze River. These are the docks used 600 years ago for building large ships, and it was right here that workers laid the so-called bird sternum, the wooden framework, of Zheng He's ships. After each ship was completed, the gate to these docks was opened to let in the water, and the newly completed ship began to float. Following the narrow waterway, the new ship sailed to the sea via the Yangtze River. The first of Zheng He's voyages to the Western Seas began on a day in July 1405. Zheng He's fleet was to set off from the port of Liaojia in Taizang, and on the day, the port was a scene of great excitement. Against the sky could be seen the sails of no less than 300 massive ships. Lugo 有的跟大伽马的最大的船比是120倍,就是从造船的技术吨位和规模来说,这是世界上是首缺一次的,西方行业讲是没办法相比的。When Zhang He's fleet of 317 ships carrying 27,000 men sailed out into the sea, it was the beginning of the greatest voyage ever undertaken in Chinese history, and it would be commonly referred to by later generations as Zheng He's voyages into the Western Seas. Zheng He was to make many more voyages. While he was on his fifth seagoing journey, far away in Beijing, the new royal palace being built along the south-north central line of the city in a highly symmetrical manner was just beginning to reveal itself. The central line, which ran across the entire city, highlighted the city's landmarks in a way that was stately, orderly, grand, and harmonious to the eye. Kanjiao 完全是以这个青绿色、冷色调，在黄河红之间起到了非常非常好的应容，一种协调作用，把两种大的色块给它打破了，打破成一个非常生动的这种这种色彩。The dark red palace walls and the golden yellow tiles of its roofs set the Forbidden City apart from all the other buildings around it. Building the Forbidden City involved countless bricks, tiles and other construction materials and all were made according to highly complicated processes and this is to say nothing of the numerous decorative carvings. Behind the hall named Bao He, which means preserving harmony, lies the largest flight of stone steps carved out of a single piece of stone.
Four very impressive looking octagonal towers were built to guard the corners of the Forbidden City. Each tower has nine beams, 18 pillars, 72 ridges and 1,500 other parts. No seams are visible. All the parts were joined using mortise and tenon construction techniques. In every sense, these towers are a marvel. Well, two years before the magnificent Forbidden City was completed, the Ming government made another important decision that would reinforce Beijing's position as the new capital. A great bell would be forged as a symbol of Beijing's newfound prosperity. A Chinese saying goes, any great feat of history, whether civilian or military, is commemorated by the construction of a huge bell. And so it was in the year 1418, when the ruler of the Ming Dynasty, who had decided to move his capital from Nanjing to Beijing, issued instructions for the making of a huge bell to commemorate his exploits. In March of 1418, master bell makers were called to Beijing, and there they learned of the specifications the government had set for the new bell. They were unbelievable. The bell was to be 6.94 meters tall, 3.3 meters wide at the mouth, and weigh 46.5 tons. Producing such a massive bell even today would be an extraordinary undertaking. Yet the master craftsman decided to make the bell using traditional clay mold techniques. In this traditional technique, a large pit is made in the ground to which is added a mound of clay in the desired shape. A layer of very fine clay is added to this mound so it can receive fine paper on which Buddhist sutras have been written. The paper is applied upside down to imprint the characters on the paper onto the layer of clay. When the characters and intaglio on the clay are done, the clay is fired to create the inner layer of a mold. This will later be joined by yet more layers. Tomin 一代一代传下来到明朝仍然是处于世界的巅峰 In theory, the creation of a huge bell necessitated a huge furnace, but at the time, there was no furnace large enough to hold more than 50 tons of molten bronze. The only solution was to have dozens of smaller furnaces working in unison. The molten bronze from these furnaces had to be released into the mold in turn, and the process had to be completed in one go. There was no room for error, either in timing or in furnace temperature. One of the purposes of moving the capital from Nanjing to Beijing was to consolidate defenses in the north. China's north was located in the middle of two very different civilizations, one of which was agricultural, the other nomadic. All 5,000 kilometers of the Great Wall were constructed with this problem in mind. The Great Wall was high, incredibly long and very solid, being built of massive slabs of stone. All the way from its eastern end to its western end, the wall had passes, lookout stands and beacon towers, thousands of them. Everything about it, its appearance, layout and aesthetic design, testified to a maximum inputs of human effort and resources. Construction on the Great Wall had begun 2,000 years before during the spring and autumn and warring states periods, and work had continued on the wall right up until the time of the Ming Dynasty. 
It was a project unmatched by any other engineering project in terms of size, length, difficulty and duration of time required to complete it. The engineering technology used in the construction of the Great Wall peaked during the Ming Dynasty, both in terms of the size of structure it could produce and the defence purposes for which it could be used. During the 28 years between 1405 and 1433, the fleet commanded by Zheng He made seven voyages to Southeast Asia, the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, and the eastern coast of the African continent. Chinese people of that time held the strong belief that the sky was round and the earth was square. This being the case, the possibility of suddenly falling into some abyss at the end of the world was naturally a concern. However, as worried as people were, Zheng He was still determined to reach the edge of the planet. Incredibly, the fleet was largely able to avoid the numerous submerged reefs and uncharted oceans and managed to stay on course through the use of traditional compasses and astronomical knowledge accumulated in China over the ages. On board Zheng He's ships were navigators who were also charged with the responsibility of making, revising and recording the route the fleet had taken. This was in part to help facilitate a safe return. On the charts made by these navigators we can see recorded in great detail the routes taken by the fleet. Included are directions, water depth readings, reference objects, shallows and submerged reefs. Thanks to the compasses and the guidance of the navigation chart, Zheng He's fleet arrived at its destinations and the fleet never got lost at sea. The purpose of Zheng He's voyages was to show to the rest of the world the wealth and prosperity of the Ming Dynasty and its policy of maintaining good relations with its neighbours. As Zheng He's tactics involved presenting lavish gifts to prepare for his voyages, half of the country had been busy collecting together examples of the best things the nation produced. Porcelain and silk made up the greater proportion of these gifts.和下西洋跟海外的贸易和风俗习惯 Among the cargo Zheng He carried with him were more than 10,000 books. The idea was that by distributing them, he would spread the word abroad about Chinese civilization and traditional Confucian ideas. Well, hardly surprisingly, it was not the books that attracted the most interest in the places where Zheng He dropped anchor but the beautiful silks and brocades he brought with him, not to mention the porcelain, whose exports reached unprecedented levels during the Ming Dynasty. Thank you for staying with us on New Frontiers, and join me again next time when we'll bring you more about Chinese civilization. I'm Ji Xiaojun from CCTV International. Goodbye.